you are at Harvard. Yeah. You're one of the most respected people in the history of Harvard. Um, that said, you did write a book with the N-word in it, and you also have a lot of opinions that challenge uh, the mainstream perspectives on race from all sides. Well, hopefully we'll get to talk about some of them. Um, but what's your view on Harvard and universities in general and speech? Yeah, Did you feel pressure from any direction on, um, on, first of all, the title of this book, the content of the book, and in general, your views on race? Yeah, I am very laudatory of Harvard University. Um, I've been at Harvard since uh, 1984. I think it is a wonderful place to work. I um, there has not there ha I, I have uh, you know in 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 the various positions I've taken with is in, in particularly with respect to this book or all my other books. What has Harvard University done? Harvard University has done nothing but provide support, sustenance, encouragement. Um, you know, I think that uh, people get down on Harvard University. I would say to anybody, imagine the following. Imagine that the ethos of Harvard University became the governing ethos of the United States overnight. Tomorrow, we would wake up in a much better United States of America. I, um, you know, I, I, I have, um, I've been supported by Harvard University. I think well of Harvard University. That's not to say that I don't have criticisms of it, but um, by and large, Harvard University, more than by and large, overwhelmingly, it has provided me, and I think it overwhelmingly provides uh, my colleagues with a work setting in which they can do their work uh, without fear, and you know that's a good thing. Are there certain are there certain you know aspects of Harvard University about which I'm critical? Yeah, sure. Uh, by the way, I think a few people, rightfully or wrongfully, would. Um disagree with you that if the ethos of Harvard University took over the country, it'd be a better place. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of interesting ways to break that down because Harvard, there's not one ethos. There's a lot of things going yes. on that are very interesting. Yes. Uh, but one of the things that's happening is uh, the disproportionate and a kind of aggressive growth of the administration versus uh, faculty and students. I, I think the power of university should always be with the faculty and the students. That's where the beauty is. That's where the flourishing happens. And the more you have kind of rules and bureaucracy and all this kind of stuff, the less powerful the university is. I think that uh, at my university and at many universities, that's right. There's too much bureaucracy, too much regulation, uh, and you know, are there are there dangers to freedom of expression? at my university and at other universities? Answer, yeah, there are. There are. So, uh, and this has really hit home for me. There was, a, there was a period of time in which I was, I was getting off of, you know, I, I'd, gotten, I'd gotten off of all boards. I was just doing my work, forget it. I'm just gonna do my work. I'm not gonna be on, you know, associated with any organizations. In the last five years, that has changed quite dramatically. I have, I have gotten on various, I have associated, I've reassociated myself with various organizations, mainly organizations involving academic freedom because uh, of what's going on uh, at, you know, on university campuses. Again, I have been, at least thus far, thus far, uh, this hasn't pinched me where I live but um, you mean in the space of ideas, in the space of ideas, in the space of speech, in the face of you know teaching, you know I I haven't I haven't been pinched, but I am concerned about things. So, for instance, let's imagine that you're applying for a job. You know, you want to be an assistant professor, or let's suppose that you're seeking a promotion. 
uh, at, in, on many university campuses, you are asked to give a DEI statement in which you say, um, I plan to, you know, you know one, one of the reasons why you should hire me or one of the reasons why you should promote me is because I'm going to, you know, advance the, you know, the DEI uh, ambitions. Diversity, equity, and inclusion for people who don't know. This yeah. is the general uh, set of programs uh, that uh, most universities now have. Yes, I, I, that's right. So, you know, you've got to sort of, you know, basically what you're being asked to do whether they say it explicitly or not, they don't say this explicitly, but this is what they're being, this is what is up. What you're being asked to do is to say, I'm down with the diversity, equity, and inclusion ethos, program, policy, campaign. And here's what I've done that shows that I'm down with this program and therefore I'm okay. Well, you know, a lot of what I do would fit very comfortably within that. But let's suppose that I didn't, just suppose I didn't like this. And by the way, there's certain aspects of the DEI, you know, industry that I don't like. You mean to tell me that, uh, you know, I'm being judged at an academic institution? Let's suppose I want to be a chemist. Let's suppose I want to be a physicist. Let's suppose I want to be, I don't care. Uh, you know, a, a, a you know, a critic of literature. Uh, I oppose this program. I don't, you know, I'm I, I, I don't think this is the way in which higher education should be going. Should I have to, on pain of relinquishing my ability to be hired, uh, should I have to sign on to this? Uh, just suppose, and let, let let's change it around. Let's not make it a DEI campaign. Let's make it a Make America Great Again campaign. What would we think then? Let's suppose it was something that said, instead of it saying DEI, let's make it, let's make it say um, the advancement of American capitalism as we know it. We want you to be down with that. What have you done? that shows us that you believe in the advancement of capitalism in America. Would I be happy about, no, I would say this is, no. Well, no with respect to these, as far as I'm concerned, with the, you know, the DEI statements. Oh, here's another one. Um, I just learned, and in fact, I mean, th there's certain things that are happening and I must say, I mean, I'm in academia, but uh, it, it's it's news to me. I didn't know, know until relatively recently about positionality statements. So these are statements in which somebody writes an article. Let's suppose, you know, I write an article. And um, it's not enough for me just to submit my article to some law review or to some, you know, some other sort of journal. No, in addition to me submitting my article, I've got to give a, a, a positionality statement in which I say whether I am, you know, gay or straight or what, or what have you, in which I say my race, in which I say my nationality, in which I say my, you know, my stance toward this ideological position or that ideological position. Interesting. What? Is this uh, uh, becoming a kind of a standard? I don't know how widespread it is. I know there was a, night, a very good article in the New York Times uh, a couple of days ago about these positionality statements. And, and in fact, that's what sort of tipped me off. Somebody had told me there's a law review at my home institution. And I had a friend who sort of mentioned this offhandedly and who, who said, well, I submitted an article to this journal, and I was a little bit taken aback insofar as they did have me fill out a questionnaire in which, it, in which I was required to state my race, state this, state that, state the other. 
And, you know, um, as far as I'm concerned, well, what does that have to do with a proper assessment of somebody's work? This concerns me. Um, I'm concerned about the fact, you, you know, a, a little while ago you mentioned, a little while ago you mentioned the word Negro. Uh, at, I was talking with colleagues a couple months ago and somebody mentioned that uh, this word had come up in their class because what had happened was one student was reading from a Supreme Court decision, and the word Negro was part of what they read out, and another student held up his hand and said to the student who was reading, hey, you should be careful because, you know, I find the word Negro offensive, and you need to be careful about even saying a word that would be offensive to someone. And this person, and then, you know, the teacher was, you know, well, you know, you know, what should I say in those circumstances? You know, what should I have said? And I volunteered, you know, and, you know, and, and you know, and I said, well, gosh, that's really interesting because see, if that had come up in my class, um, I would have said, well, frankly, I don't, you know, I don't see what the, the I don't even see what the big deal is because I use the word Negro. And, um, you know, uh, Harvard University is not, on, you know, on some island that is, you know, f apart from everything else that's happening in the world. If these things are happening in other places, if they're happening at Stanford, if they're happening at Yale, if they're happening at Columbia, uh, you know, they're going to happen at Harvard. Um, but thus far, and I'm, I'm, I am most especially experienced in life at Harvard Law School. Harvard Law School is an open environment in which ideas are uh, tested, and they are tested uh, fully. And uh, it's, it's, it's because of that that I say I have been fully supported at Harvard Law School, feel that it is an excellent place in which to do work. I'm a, I'm, I'm a fan. I am a fan, and I'm not embarrassed to say it. I am a fan uh, of, uh, of, of my workplace, Harvard Law School. I'm very happy to be associated with Harvard Law School. Zooming out, uh, in general, in education, um, uh, there's something called critical race theory. Mm -hmm. um, can you comment on what are your thoughts about uh, this kind of perspective on race and race in America uh, to the degree that it's becoming a part of yeah. the education program. Okay, so the first thing I wanna say- What is it? Well, the first thing I wanna say about critical race theory is that critical race theory has become a term. So I'm gonna put quotation marks around the term critical race theory. We can, we, I'm, in a minute, I'll talk about critical race theory without quotation marks. But to begin with, I want to talk about critical race theory because the reason why people are talking about critical race theory so much now is because politicians, mainly Republican right-wing politicians, have created a boogeyman critical race theory with quotation marks around it. They have created a boogeyman and they have tried to make it seem as though this boogeyman believes all sorts of ideas that Americans should loathe and that Americans should fear. And they've created this boogeyman and they've created it and they've done a very good job of creating the boogeyman and they have mobilized uh, sufficient, uh, um, you know, public support such that, you know, there are a number of states that have passed laws uh, prohibiting the teaching of so-called critical race theory. Now, the first thing I want to say about this 
is that um, this campaign, this these laws, these various policies telling teachers don't teach this and don't teach that, and you can't you can't use this book, you can't use that book. This is a frightening encroachment on freedom, freedom of speech, freedom to learn, freedom to listen, freedom to read. That's terrible. And it's one of the most frightening things that has happened in American life in recent memory. So that's the first thing I want to say about so-called critical race theory. Now, now I'll say something. I'm going to take the quotation marks off of the term critical race theory. Critical race theory is, is a sort of a, you, you could have a nice conversation about actually what it is. Um, one way of viewing it is to say that, well, critical race theory is a community of ideas that comes from a community of people. Uh, the community of people would be people uh, in legal academia, in the um, you know the period nineteen eight starting in probably the middle of the nineteen eighties, it would be associated with people like Derek Bell. It would be associated with people like Kimberly Crenshaw, people like Charles Lawrence, people like Richard Delgado, people like Mary Matsuda, and these are folks who held. Uh, em embraced a couple of, you know, they, they, they articulated a couple of propositions. One of their propositions was that um, liberal race policy was insufficient. They would say that um, the racial policies of a person like my old boss, Thurgood Marshall, the lib, you know, the liberal liberal racial policies were insufficient to grapple fully with the pervasiveness and the depth and intensity of American racism. Their their basic claim, and I think by the way, it was a good claim. Their basic claim was that American racism is more central, more deeply embedded in American life than uh, most people perceived, including liberals. And I think there was a lot of strength to that proposition. Um, but then they also took on some other propositions with which I was in very strong disagreement. So I think it's perfectly fine to say that racism is a force in American life that is deeper, more pervasive, more stubborn, more resilient than I think people often, you know, often understand, often perceive. But then some of the folks, you know, in, in you know, critical race theory um, push further. Uh, one of the propositions that some of the people in critical race theory took was the proposition that um, uh, America was doomed to always be a country that would be governed according to the dictates of white supremacy. Uh, Derek Bell, who was a colleague of mine and a friend of mine, took that position. He talked about the permanence of uh, racism in American life. And he took the position that the various changes that had been wrought in American life were really, you know, mainly cosmetic. Uh, they didn't amount to a whole lot. I mean, Derek Bell took the position, you know, the, the second reconstruction, the civil rights movement. Well, yeah, it made changes, but at the end of the day, black people were still you know, a after the second reconstruction, we're still in a position of almost, you know, you know, I don't know, some of them would even say neo-slavery. Well, I think that's ridiculous. Uh, the second reconstruction changed a lot. And as for neo-slavery, neo-slavery, what are you talking about? 
uh, a black American was president of the United States between the years 2008 and 2016. I mean, what what are we talking about here? Uh, there has been a tremendous change, and I think people ought to understand that. Now, am I saying that everything is peachy keen and all right? No. Uh, the United States is still, uh, to a very large extent, still a pigmentocracy, but that doesn't mean that a lot hasn't changed. A lot has. So I disagree with certain tenets of critical race theory and have been very outspoken in my disagreement. There's another one, by the way, I need to mention because we've talked so much in our discussion about freedom of speech, freedom to teach, freedom of listening. Another big problem that I've had with some of the people who talk of themselves as critical race theory people has to do with their attitude towards freedom, freedom of speech. Some critical race theory people think that uh, the American legal system is wrong in the latitude that it gives to what they call hate speech or the latitude that it gives to what they would view as racist beliefs. Uh, some, of, some of the people who associate themselves with critical race theory think that racist beliefs ought to be expunged with the aid of state power, if need be. Well, I'm against that. And, um, you know, I, I think we are at a moment, a, an ironic moment, in which actually it's the right wing that has embraced some of the ideas that were championed by some of, this, some of the people who call themselves critical race theorists. You know, they say, oh, we ought to expunge hate speech. Well, the right wing is saying this critical race theory, that's hate speech, so let's expunge it. And um, so I, you know, again, I've been very outspoken in my criticism of uh, some of the illiberal dimensions of critical race theory. So I've, you know, I've been a critic of certain features of critical race theory. I have uh, applauded certain features of critical race theory. Um, you know, critical race theory, you know, there's some aspects of it that I think have been useful. There's some aspects of it that I think have been, you know, profoundly wrongheaded. Um, so that's where I am. And I certainly, and, you know, above all, I certainly am against any efforts to remove it from, you know, the intellectual universe. It is a part of our intellectual universe. People ought to know about it and people ought to debate it and people ought to be free to make up their minds to uh, conclude what they will about the strengths and weaknesses of critical race theory.